I think it's a, a wonderful experience to have you here. Uh, your knowledge and your experience in the tourism industry is invaluable, and I'd like to take advantage of that right now and discuss specifics with you, and especially, let's look back now at Dubai. Uh, now that some 20 years you were with Jumeirah Group from the onset uh, in Dubai, what do you think it was that made Dubai a tourism destination? Well, I first came to Dubai in 1978 before a lot of you were born, but I must say that one thing that really has always struck me about Dubai is that there has been a vision, mm. there has been objectives, and most of all, there has been leadership. And I say this every time I'm asked this question, and I only say it because I really believe it's true. We've had just incredible leadership from His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum over all the years that I've been involved in Dubai. And uh, to see w what he was prepared to do. Mm. I was working for a British company called Forte Hotels in Dubai uh, in the early 90s. And I used to drive by the construction, which was starting then, of uh, Burj Al Arab. And I said, what are they thinking of here that they would do this? Little did I know I'd be responsible actually for trying to put guests into the hotel. But it just shows you that there always has been this grand vision. And a lot of people like to think, oh, well, that's the oil money. But, you know, it, it, Dubai itself, only about 5% of the GDP is related to oil. Mm. And, of course, it's in, a, in, in an oil-rich region, and that does matter as well. But I think it's the vision, it's the willingness to do it. And then there have been some really uh, amazing uh, landmark decisions, such as the establishment of Emirates Airlines. Because I think that to have airlift into a country, and that's why I mentioned last night about open skies, how important it is, how vital it is to stop looking upon airlines as, say, something to do with the, with, with the state, with the government, with a national asset. It's that airlines are a business, mm -hmm. and they should be treated as such, just like a hotel company is a business. A hotel company doesn't need hotel rights to build a hotel in the city. It needs planning permission. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if an airline meets all the safety standards, why shouldn't it be allowed to, to fly to a destination if somebody wants to take the business risk to do so? The vision is key. Um, what about the balance between uh, the public sector and the private sector? And when does the public sector get out of the way of the private sector and let them do what they need to do? What roles does each one play? Well, I think it's up to the government, the public sector, to create the, 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 the pathway to create the foundation and to facilitate the private sector to come in to invest. And sometimes to do that, it has to have the seed. It has to say, well, okay, the government will build this hotel. The government definitely, as far as infrastructure is concerned, mm. airports, roads, and uh, indeed safety and security within, within a state is very much and always will be the responsibility of a government. But the government must facilitate, in my opinion, private enterprise to feel comfortable to come in. And even in Dubai, we've worked very closely in that regard, again over the years with the Department of Tourism and Commerce Marketing, where they really did help the growing hotel industry by facilitating a meeting, for example, every two months between all in the travel and tourism business and the tourism sector to discuss the issues of the day. It might be visas, it might be some kind of immigration, it might be just infrastructure, whatever. But it was good to be always able to have one body to go to where we could discuss what we wanted to. What do you think um, are the key strategies necessary to build a tourism destination? When you look at Sri Lanka, it has all the amazing natural resources that any country could ever wish for. You've got everything from heritage, uh, you've got wildlife, you've got beautiful beaches, you've got city centers that are in development, understood, yes. but it has, it has the raw materials. What are the key strategies involved? Well, I think the key strategies first, under the uh, Minister of Tourism, and I know that it does happen here, is very much having the proper body in place that is responsible for the development of tourism. It's also very, very important, I think, to communicate the benefits of our industry mm -hmm. and let people see, because when you look at the sustainability issue, for example, an awful lot of people are concerned about aircraft flying, about uh, the, the overall global warming, but at the same time, what often gets ignored is the fact that if you're creating a lot of employment, particularly for entry-level jobs, 
And we see in some parts of Europe where there's huge unemployment in under 25 year olds and how important in places like the parts of the Middle East where people become radicalized because they can't get jobs, they have mm. nothing else to do. So it is so important to create employment for young people. So I think the, the, the total strategy is communicating to the world at large that tourism, as I keep saying, is a force for good. Mm. And I, I, I sincerely believe that, that it is. It's definitely having the infrastructure, it's definitely having the open skies and the airlift and going back to infrastructure, particularly um, with airports like an island nation like Sri Lanka will depend on most of its visitors, uh, not from the domestic sector, which yes, can be very important, particularly in a country like India where they have about 70 million uh, hotel stays you know, from, from the domestic sector. But uh, certainly in an island nation, you need accessibility. And uh, that's vital. I think it also helps to have uh, a big population area not far from your borders and not yeah. far from where, where you are. Uh, and that is something that Dubai has said that within you know, four hours flying, there's almost two billion people living there. Mm -hmm. And that certainly helps to be able to bring people in. You mentioned in your speech, you mentioned China. And I don't think one can underestimate the value of uh, Chinese tourists in building um, a tourism industry in other countries. Mm -hmm. We're looking at a growing middle class there with the in education and the, the money to spend. And there's, but more than anything, there is a sense of curiosity about um, other cultures and yeah. the world around them. That said, there's also India. Yes. India's, uh, I, Indian tourists to Dubai surged 26% this year. Um, you've said that India will outpace China this year in terms of GDP growth, uh, a huge potential in terms of developing more business from India, and India is just next door yes. from here. How does Sri Lanka maximize that potential? <laughs> well, I think you've just said it, but it's also recognizing it already. Mm. And it was interesting when I, I went to Northern Ireland during the summer, as I was saying again last night, and met with the First Minister, uh, and uh, she was talking about, you know, why don't people from the Republic want to come to Northern Ireland? And I said, you know what, we're not worried about security in Northern Ireland, but we do worry, will we really be welcome? And I think this is why it's so important, again, is to communicate the mm. fact that, you know, people are welcome to come to your country and, of course, to facilitate how you will come to the country. And again, it's the visa situation. You know, you make it easy to buy is the old, the, the, the best way to sell anything is make it easy for the customer to purchase. Mm -hmm. So therefore, that's what we should continue to uh, emphasize, in my opinion, is to make visas easy and then to make, uh, have a very nice welcoming immigration force at airports, which is something that falls down in many airports around the world. It Nobody, makes a huge yeah. difference though, doesn't it? Well, it does. In China, they have a very good system where when you uh, arrive at immigration, the uh, immigration official is wearing a badge with his number on it. And in front of you, you have smiley face, yes. grumpy face, not a uh, neutral face. Mm. And, you know, I actually do it. I push the button if it's good, and it's nearly always good. But it, I'm sure they're also incentivized that whoever gets the most smiley faces would probably get a bonus mm -hmm. at the end of the month. Well, I hope they do anyway in China. But at least they're, they're recognizing this is the first point of entry. Mm and how important it is to have a lovely smiling face and say, oh, you're welcome to my country. How has the nature of travel evolved over the years? Well, the nature of travel, I think, first of all, it was a point earlier, you talk about the countries that are growing in terms of importance of outbound tourism. And I think in so much of this comes from the fact that there's more wealth being created in the world in the last 30 years than in the rest of time. And it's great to see middle classes coming up where they can actually afford to travel. And you look at anything, if you ever see anybody in the UK or in Europe or wherever, they win the lottery, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to go, I'm yeah. going to travel, I'm going to see the world. And people want to do that. And this is what makes the difference. It's, it's really facilitating all of that. And this will be the phenomenon of tourism for, for all time. And that's why it's so important to go back to the sustainability issue, to understand that we have a massive uh, responsibility in travel and tourism. Nobody gives the airlines credit for the fact that airline engines are now using 50% less fuel per mm. engine than they did 30 years ago. But of course people say, well, yes, but you have more aircraft flying. Mm. So therefore, you know, you have to be concerned. So we're, they're looking at biofuels. I serve on the mobility, the future of mobility council uh, for the World Economic Forum. We just met in Dubai two weeks ago. And where people really are concerned about uh, and, and predict 
that there will be a major shift towards biofuels for aircraft and also for sure electronic uh, automobiles. What about the pace of growth? Well, you know, you look at the world growth at the moment at around whatever it is, 2%. That's really not, not good enough to sustain developing, commu developing communities mm -hmm. in terms of providing enough employment and growth within employment. So I think from that point of view, uh, you know, the, we, we have to look that 4%, whilst it's uh, encouraging, it's not so, so huge. Mm -hmm. But how we sustain that growth is always going to be the challenge. And we've got to be very, very... Um, up front in the industry, like with uh, Tourism for Tomorrow, with the World Travel and Tourism Council, it's so important to show the travelling public that, yes, we care. In hotels, we can still do an awful lot more than we do mm. in order to be more sustainable in terms of our habits, in terms of what we want to do. I remember getting in, uh, in Abu Dhabi years ago, the, the, the WTTC had a summit and we had some environmentalists on. And they were in the Jumeirah Hotel, which I was CEO at the time. And uh, the, the one guy picks a, a plastic cap on top of a glass. And he said, why do we need this ca plastic cap? And actually, he's right. Why do we need it? When I inquired, well, that's the regulation, but then we must be working with the authorities to make sure regulations make sense from a sustainability point of view. Mm. There's a lot to be said about the... Gerald mentioned this in, in his introduction to you. Uh, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, sorry. Uh, mentioned this to you in his introduction that... Um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the main highway there in Dubai was, yes. there was nothing around it. Um, what do you think is, the, is a realistic timeline for uh, a country like Sri Lanka to really see itself there as a major tourism destination with the infrastructure in place? I think that... Uh, is it able to, are you able to quantify it? Well, you see, the older you get, the shorter your timeline, right? So you're, you're in a kind of a hurry to see things happening. Yes. And that's why I like living in Dubai, because it happens so quickly. But no, you, you do, for sure, is that you will see huge differences. Look at all the buildings around here. When I look out my hotel room window, I say, yeah. wow. And that all looks a bit messy at the moment with cranes everywhere. Well, it's going to look fantastic in about 12 months, 18 months. So you will already see development. And I'm sure along the coastal areas, you have very appropriate development of hotels. So I would look that you will see massive change even within Sri Lanka if everything continues like it is at the moment within the next five years. Mm. And I see no reason why. They talk about doubling tourism into Sri Lanka. And uh, I'm sure it will. So a, a five-year window is something that is, you can focus on it, you can see it, you can imagine it. Yeah. And why not? Well, I think it's also really important within a country is obviously you have uh, you know, the, the, the name brands that come in in the hotels uh, that uh, are part of the investment uh, portfolio here. But what's really important also the homegrown hotels, the homegrown brands, the homegrown uh, food and beverage industry as well. I mean, the Jumeirah Group, you, you mentioned the Burj Al Arab. Uh, that's what brings people to yes. a country. No, I think more and more people want to experience the country. They yeah. want to experience the people. They want to understand the culture. It's not just about sun, sea and sand. People are becoming much more sophisticated as travelers. They have different needs. And for sure, uh, we, we, we will see this beginning to develop. And I think uh, homegrown hotel companies have a fantastic opportunity. As you say, that's how we started with Jumeirah. Mm. I mean, most people in, in Ireland they still call it Jeremiah Beach Hotel. You know, it was Jumeirah Beach Hotel. But, you know, they, they found it even difficult to, to mm. pronounce the name uh, initially. And I think this is something that's beginning to develop and evolve. Yes, you will have the brands, and the brands are very important in terms of uh, reassuring uh, new travelers that you know this is a sophisticated uh, destination, mm. but they also want to see uh, the Mount Lavinia's of the world and all these, these these hotel groups coming up as well. And there's a place for everybody, and I'm sure that it will continue to evolve and grow and give people what they feel is an authentic experience of the country. But again, as I said last night, the real authentic experience of a country revolves totally 100% around the people of the country. How important is it? for Sri Lankans, the government ministers, the people involved in the industry to actually go outside, uh, travel outside of the country, promoting the country and attracting people to come to their country. Oh, you point. did that uh, yes. with China some 12 yes. years ago. No, no, I remember traveling in a delegation with His Highness Sheikh Mohammed yeah. about 12 years ago to China. And yes, absolutely. One has to go out, one has to talk about one's country, say what a fantastic place it is. 
participate in the travel shows, go to all of Jonathan's investment conferences. He does a really good job. But you know, it's really important, I think, the, the WTMs, the ATMs, the, the, the Asia Tourism Forums that we see all around the world at the moment. It is putting your name out there. And we did that with Jumeirah in the development of Jumeirah when nobody knew us. We would go as far away as the NYU and Hotel Investment Conference in New York, mm. where we just had to get the name out there and get people talking about our destination. And uh, I, I really do encourage promotion, promotion, promotion. And the busier you get, the more you should promote, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, I'd like to get back onto this uh, com the topic that you mentioned before, the open borders, mm -hmm. and how that links into security. Yeah. Uh, and how tourism and the travel industry can help foster um, that sense of security in the country. Yes, because it seems a bit of a contradiction, but yes. it's not. And uh, very much, we've worked now with the World Economic Forum, with the WTTC, with now all of the GTAC members. And uh, this is something we discussed every year in Davos, but particularly last year, came up very much with the, with, with, with the what would I say, the statement that we want to enhance safety and security in travel. But we believe we can do it by having a much more logical approach, first of all, to the issuing of visas. Visas no longer, as far as security is concerned, has to do with what country you come from. It's what you are as an individual, mm -hmm. who you are as an individual. And I look upon platforms like uh, Schengen and ESTA and the now ASEAN coming up as well, plus the Australian Forum, where they're all, all very sophisticated electronic platforms already. And I asked the question, well, why couldn't, for example, ASEAN and Schengen agree to talk to each other? And then why couldn't we let that evolve and develop into maybe one wider and broader uh, platform for the issuing of visas and for making people safe and secure as far as travel is concerned? And ultimately, and I know it's more an aspiration than an objective at this stage, but ultimately I see no reason why, for example, in America they have the, the Trusted Traveler program. Why couldn't we expand that mm -hmm. through uh, electronic platforms that are of the same level of sophistication as, say, the ESTA system? And if you're worried about your data being included in that, say, well, okay, I won't give it. Let it be voluntary. But if people receive the benefits of voluntarily giving their data in. They have the data on us anyway. Mm. So by giving your, your data in and, say, having a combined Schengen and ESTA platform, in my opinion, would be... An, you know, it's, as I say, it's not a WTTC objective as such, but it's certainly an objective that I have to put forward, that uh, we do develop ultimately a global trusted travel program. We're not seeing this in Sri Lanka in, the sense, in terms of my next question, in that uh, when you talk about tourism as a force for good and how governments, some governments around the world don't necessarily place the travel and tourism industry uh, uh, as a priority, uh, within their government policies. Yes. Obviously, that's not happening in Sri Lanka because we've seen now that the president is, uh, has identified the industry yes. as, a, as a major priority, especially within the next three years. But for those that don't, where is the disconnect? Well, the disconnect is that uh, we haven't got to see the president yet with the open letters, unlike in, in, in Sri Lanka where we have. And I think the disconnect could be that this, it's a big world out there. There are a lot of countries, and we've got to get around to keep espousing the benefit of our industry. And I know people can get tired of hearing the same thing, but also the, the, the message is resonating. It's mm -hmm. resonating because when we talk about 284 million jobs worldwide, yeah. when ultimately you look at one job in every 10 is supported by travel and tourism, governments sit up and take notice. And when you say that most of our employment is with young people under 30 years of age, and that we're good for entry-level jobs, then people begin to listen. And on top of that, you see that, wow, our industry is one of the biggest in the world. It's bigger than the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it's a clean industry. And it's something that I think that finally is beginning to if it's done well. grab attention. If it's done well, 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 that's our responsibility to do as well, as much as it's responsibility of governments to ensure regulation is there. And I think now with the Paris Agreement, whether you like it or whether you don't, whether the United States comes out of it or stays in it, it's going to be something that will not go away. And it's something that uh, we have to be very concerned about. We're concerned so that we can facilitate travel in a responsible way. Look at Africa, for example. Would you have the wildlife today if you hadn't had tourism? Mm. They would have killed all the animals by now. Or they would have moved them on so they would have, be able to have agriculture. But you go to the Maasai Mara and you see the tribes people there. They've been able to maintain their culture. They've been able to maintain their community within their locality. And they've been, become very proud of it because now they see that, oh, wow, foreigners like to hear about us and they, and they, and they have respect for our culture. Mm. And that's something that travel and tourism does. You've said that tourism is a product. It's an export. 
you have the ear of government yes. ministers here in Sri Lanka. What would you tell them to not do? Uh, that's a good question. Well, uh, I would tell them is not to put up artificial barriers in terms of, you say, an atrocity happens and, and from now on everybody needs a visa. I think that, as I said earlier, the visa situation is far more sophisticated than that and depends on individuals. So don't overreact. You know, we have a situation, for example, in, uh, in Egypt where we've asked the uh, governments of Russia and Britain to start traveling, let, let their airlines fly again to Sharm el Sheikh. And uh, till now, the UK government still hasn't allowed EasyJet to fly to Sharm el-Sheikh. And people are suffering. And people are suffering, and then they're suffering, and then they lose their jobs. And then they, you know, people say, you lost your job because a European country won't allow, you, allow people to come here anymore. So you begin to resent Europeans, and then they become radicalized. Mm. And then we have a, a different set of problems. So I would say, please don't put up artificial barriers. Please let's work when some atrocity happens with the country to see how we can help rather than stop. I would still have said, you know, Tunisia, for example, when they had that uh, atrocity on the beach, mm -hmm. you know, everybody was stopped immediately, everybody was evacuated. Could there not be some kind of a, a force somewhere within the European Union, for example, that could say to Tunisia, look, we can come and help you with security so that people still feel safe to be able to travel? Because just blocking travel and overreacting, I think, is, uh, is the worst thing you can do. On the flip side, though, from a traveler's perspective, yes. when something like that happens, it has a huge psychological impact. Well, it does, and it doesn't. People are in always. In terms of their choices of where they want to go. Yes, but people are always very surprised by the bounce back effect. And I know that Paris has had a, you know, quite a bit of a challenge in getting the bounce back to come. But it does come. As I said in my speech, you know, tourism is resilient. And people want to travel. Naturally, they want to feel safe. There is demand now from the UK to travel to Sharm el-Sheikh. EasyJet wants to travel to Sharm el-Sheikh. So if the people want to fly on the plane, the plane wants to fly. The, a company called Control Risk came into uh, Egypt at the, at the request of the government of Egypt and did an assessment on all of its airports, made its recommendations regarding security. So the recommendations were implemented. Now people want to travel. Everything has been done, so what more can we do? So I think it's really important, as I say, not to put the barriers up and really to listen to what the, uh, what the demands are from the public. And I know governments are very concerned to ensure, because they'll be blamed afterwards if they didn't give proper advice. But the advice sometimes in travel advisory goes a little over the top. How can Sri Lanka become the Dubai of South Asia? Well, again, we can see that you know, you've got the president who will come to this conference, who will show how important it is for him with the tourism minister here this morning. And, and, and last night. And you know, once leaders begin to show the leadership and the understanding to their people about, hey, tourism is a force for good. This is good for you guys to get foreigners in here. And people love having visitors. People love telling them about their culture, about their country. And you know, I've dealt, as I said yesterday, with Sri Lankans since as far back as I can remember in, uh, in Dubai, going right back to the 70s. And they're fantastic people. Uh, I met uh, one of the waiters upstairs last night. I walked into the, to the lounge and he said, Ah, Mr. Norris. I said, well, Do I know you? He said, I'm Mohan from The Diplomat. I said, The Diplomat in Bahrain in 1985. And he, he had worked for us there and he oh. still remembered. So, you know, you have these fantastic people all over the world. I come from a country where we've had, we have, we have like 40 million Irish people, or people who claim Irish ancestry in the United States. We've only got 4 million left in Ireland. But, you know, so we're used to being an immigrant country. And, you know, you have so many people, so many Sri Lankans who work overseas that if the uh, conditions are right, they would be delighted to come back here, not only with their expertise, not only with their employment desires, but also a lot of them could be able to come back with their investment. The difference between the two countries, between Dubai and Sri Lanka is money. Uh, Dubai has a lot of it. Uh, Sri Lanka doesn't. And that's why foreign investment is extremely important. Um, what do you think is absolutely necessary that should be in place to encourage foreign investment? It depends how you measure wealth. Okay. You see, Dubai had a population of a couple of hundred thousand back in the 70s yes. or 80s. Yeah. But as you say, it had oil, it had, it had money. This country has a different type of wealth. Yes, it, it has the people. It has the natural environment. And you know, look at the port just out the, the window of this hotel here, and you see what a busy port it is and how, how big it is. 
So I think it almost comes back to the same thing as uh, promoting tourism. Mm -hmm. You look at what are your USPs, what are your unique selling potential. So what can you do? What have you got? You've got a fantastic country, you've got great people, you've got educated people, and you've got the, you've got the potential to be able to promote yourself and sell yourself. So I don't think it's any more difficult than doing something like Dubai did mm -hmm. in terms of tourism development. One of the interesting things that um, you've said is, is that the attitude of, yes, we can succeed, is everywhere in Dubai. And I love that philosophy, that yes, we can, that you have a vision. And, and you see that in China as well, is that there is a, an element of just do it. Yes. Go out and do it, see what happens after, but let's just build. Um, and they have that vision to do so. Um, and you continue on to say that it is almost like here we can dare to dream and dare to be something different. Yeah. Well, why not? Uh, you, you, as I say, you, you've got all the ingredients and there's nothing preventing uh, Sri Lanka. I mean, it's almost patronizing to say you can do it. Of course, Sri Lanka knows they can do it. And uh, if Sri Lanka has done it before and Sri Lanka will do it again. You have your civilization, you have everything here, and you have your massive culture and you have fantastic... Everything is right for tourism to succeed. All you need now is proper regulation uh, to ensure that that's, that's correctly and intelligently facilitated. Mr. Lawless? It's an absolute pleasure Thank you very to much, speak Benita. with you. That wasn't too bad, was it? Oh, great, thank you. <laughs>